take my hat off to those entrepreneurs standing up there, only getting six minutes to pitch their business, and the fate of their business uh, rests in our hands. And, um, and I guess that's really what I'm talking about today, is, is, is when you're going out there trying to launch and grow your own business, you know, there's so many things to be worrying about. Uh, you know, where's your next round of funding going to come from? Um, so there's so many other things to worry about. Should you be worrying about the infrastructure on which your, your uh, application is actually running? So the baton of power is without power at the moment, it seems. So if you can just go to the next slide there for me, somebody. Okay, so, and really, you know, when you're in the startup phase, it is a marathon that you need to run. There are so many things and barriers that you need to, to overcome. And I was just looking and trying to plot where the guys from today's session are actually sitting on this chart. And they're really trying to get themselves a beta release of some sort out the door so that they can actually showcase it, get their first customers to market, and, and take it from there and get themselves over the next round of what they need to do in order to launch their business. So really, to, to be able to soar... The key here is to stick to what you're good at. And I think too many people in the process of a startup business try to do too many things, don't leverage enough of the people and the ecosystems that are around them and get distracted from what they call, call the, of what they need to do. You know, make sure that you, you know, that's about those principle of the rocks. You want to put, when you're putting a bunch of rocks inside a, a jar and you want to fill it up and you've got big pebble, you've got big stones and you've got little pebbles and, and sand, the way to fill that thing up is to start with the big pebbles and to leave the other sm the, 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 the small sand, grains of sand, really till to the last. The start with the big rocks. We can move on. So really, stick to what you're best at and let a cloud provider take care of the infrastructure. Now, to what extent can a cloud provider, in fact, uh, allow you to forget about the underlying platform that you're running on and focus on developing the application, getting the funding, marketing your offering out through to the end consumer that, you, that you're after at the end of the day. You can jump over. So, you know, in terms of the traditional view, um, the last thing any venture capitalist wants to be doing these days is, is funding a large IT investment that, uh, that might not be required. So the traditional view, if this is your forecast of the growth of your business, and it could be an exponential one, let's hope it's that. You know, why would you be making, um, you know, large incremental um, purchases for, for hardware or commitments to hardware? You know, if you go to a typical web hosting company, you know, there's generally a three-year contractual term or a period of t uh, a contract that you're signing up for. That's taking away from your ability to raise equity at the end of the day, because that is a financial commitment and a financial burden that the business needs to take on. So you either forgo the cash flow, buy your own equipment and host it somewhere, or you sign up with a contract uh, for a fixed period, limits your ability to raise new equity, or alternatively, you know, literally pay as you go without any contractual commitment that you can scale up and scale down. So if that's what it looks like, this is the sort of uh, the investment the allocated resources that you might need to do in order to scale, but the real growth, it might, the actual load that comes on the system might look something like this. So it might start a lot slower than you, than you anticipate in the beginning. You might hitch this uh, marketing kicks in and you have a significant acceleration of your business. And you might have the, find a situation where, you know, that with, uh, throughout the life cycle of the product, you might supersede it with something else. And there might be a dip what do you do with all of this investment that you've made in infrastructure at that point in time? So, huh, the power's back. There we go. So, big initial investment, a lot of undersupply over here, um, and then uh, oversupply in the next phase when, uh, when the, where the product needs to be refreshed. Really, what you want to be able to do is, over the life cycle of your product, really to be able to match the infrastructure that you've got to the load that you ultimately see uh, in that environment with a much lower initial investment and less oversupply. So, so this is just, uh, we've got, there's several examples out there, but uh, you know, where you, where you really, 
many of the startups that we've launched is where cash flow is critical right in that initial phase, uncertainty of traffic. They've been able to give back some of the resources and infrastructure that they've got to run the systems without any penalties. Um, and then be able to, to really um, you know, get more resources when they need it. So when there's significant testing on the go that they would like to, to do or housekeeping that needs to be done on the system, they can spin up additional test servers that they might need that they only run for a very short period of time and then give those back. So many of you are looking at the opportunity that sits in front of you and, and want to become cloud providers of yourselves. Most of the solutions we've seen pitched today are in fact cloud um, orientated options and it is the way of the future. So if you look at some of the research that was shown, if you look at the entire software industry, that the annual license growth is only really growing worldwide around 4%. But where um, subscription revenue, including software as a service, that is growing at nearly four, more than four times uh, that growth rate of the software industry. Um, and by, by 2016, we see software as a service revenue potentially accounting for 24% of global software revenue uh, in this case. So quite significant. So, you know, so just another example, Thermo Fisher Scientifica is, um, is, is a, a lab information system that provides services to pharmaceutical companies, mining houses, and those uh, sort of guys um, in the industry. And typically what's involved is that they would go and install a significant amount of, uh, uh, or expect the customer to install a significant amount of infrastructure on site, and pay the big price tag associated with their software to running a lab. But what they wanted to do is really go after potentially new markets, smaller organizations doing development work uh, in this area, that they could more economically service them through the cloud. So they launched their limb service on demand, and, um, and we've even been able to do, for, even for those customers, be able to provide cloud-based disaster recovery. So really ensure that the customer's got a high availability platform, yet with disaster recovery in case anything would have had to, to happen with their system. So none of their research data would ever be lost. And really, by leveraging an underlying cloud infrastructure um, and launch their new software as a service application, they were able to innovate faster and, and, and really grow their revenue significantly in a market sector that they never thought would really be possible. So gone beyond their borders and into a market segment that is much, uh, a much smaller uh, a client base than they ever thought they would get to. And um, if you just um, have a look at some of the, the cloud customers of ours that we've pr propelled forward into acquisitions. So there's been some really, we do over, there's over 2,000 software as a service um, vendors that live on our platforms today globally. And these are just some of them that I picked out. That have, uh, that have been acquired um, in the last uh, little while. And you can just see some very big acquisitions, you know, like Taleo, 1.9 billion uh, business objects. We're also using our cloud platform quite extensively. And various others, um, uh, Claremail that do a, a mobile internet banking application, for example, bought by Monetize, uh, are just some of the guys that have been able to really propel their business forward. And they all adopted the same philosophy is that let somebody else run the infrastructure. Um, so like this, so basically get somebody else to run and look after the infrastructure that you require. And then on top of that, build out your software as a service application. Now, in many cases, customer's software is not written to be multi-tenanted. In other words, that it cannot support multiple enterprises using the same code base on a platform and be able to divvy it up. So some of them have only got software that was originally deployed to be run on site. And we help them to transition from this phase of being single tenanted through to, to multi tenanted. So we have the ability to spin up for, for those clients. They can still take advantage of the cloud and go and sell their wares out there on the internet, but literally spin up individual instances um, for customers that they would be targeting, particularly enterprise customers. And then over time, develop their software to be more multi-tenanted, orientated, 
and generally to be able to, to go after a smaller client base. This is fine if you're going to be doing you know, a few large organizations, but over time you need to evolve your system um, to that sort of approach. And for some customers, running on virtual servers is sufficient. When they really get to scale and they want to have dedicated hardware, you know, our cloud system can accommodate def, uh, different hardware, pl uh, dedicated hardware platforms that might have come from the client's environment. But we're able to integrate them into the same uh, network and security environment that is, uh, that is all self-provisioned. So basically take that out to market. The two other things that over time that customers have been able to do is take advantage of our APIs into our cloud platform. So obviously the one way to do it is just to log on to the portal and configure whatever resources that you might need uh, in or as you grow your software application. The other way is to completely automate it based on the demand that comes into your environment. So that might be customers joining and adding to, to the environment, um, or it could be additional load that comes on at, at a peak period uh, when the users, the same user base actually comes onto the environment. So these feedback systems in terms of the capacity, there's ways that you can script it to say, you know, after every thousand users that come onto my platform, spin up another web server, put it into the load balance pool, uh, apply the same um, instance that we've got, and spin it up immediately for, uh, for, 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 for immediate deployment. And that's the sort of thing that you can do through the API. You can orchestrate all of our underlying hardware um, based on the application and, and, and what you've got uh, in that environment. So also what we allow customers to do is to launch globally because we've got platforms uh, throughout the world. So, so many of them also pilot in, in various different geographies before they take it to a first world market, for example. So we have a lot of the guys piloting stuff out in the east or even Africa for that matter and then, uh, and then take it uh, uh, throughout, the, throughout the world. The other thing as well, in terms of leverage, um, as you, you know, take your software to market, is really that you, don't wanna, that you wanna be as credible as possible, particularly if you're servicing enterprise customers, security and compliance and regulatory uh, uh, compliance is gonna be of big importance to them, so they wanna, wanna know what your certifications are. Uh, they will wanna know how you're backing up the data. Is it on a high availability platform? Is the, is, the, is the systems protected by some sort of a disaster recovery environment? So by taking, you take on the characteristics of your underlying provider and, you can, and your software can only really be as available and you can't offer SLAs anything better than the underlying platform on which you, which you live. So we have a 99.99% uh, availability guarantee which is backed up with penalties and that gives confidence to our clients that they can go and offer similar SLAs uh, to their customers. Also, two other things that you want to be able to do. So it's not just about the infrastructure, but it's also about the people that are going to run and operate it. Are you going to, in your startup phase, employ people to patch operating systems, do the daily backups, um, perform perf uh, capacity management uh, and optimization, database management, and all of these different tasks that are required to keep things running? So we have packages of services that uh, clients can, can make, take advantage of. Uh, either they can take a self-service uh, infrastructure as a service offering, or the technical operations, uh, or the application operation services from us to be able to, to then extend their support capability. Obviously, you can keep this in-house, um, but if you're leveraging the best practices that we have, um, you know, and uh, more, several decades of running managed services on behalf of clients, um, uh, it just gives you greater credibility and takes away that burden from yourself. We also allow you to connect to your customers, particularly if they're enterprise customers in many different ways. So you can connect from their on-premise system to, to our cloud platform and to your applications through a secure um, RPSec tunnel, for example, if, it's, uh, if, you don't, if HTTPS is not sufficient for that particular client. Or what you can do is put in a direct connection to one of your clients for them to run their, their, your application uh, um, as an extension of their on-premise network that they have. So either with a direct lease line connection or a VPN uh, connection that you, might, uh, th that you might require. So really, in addition to that, we also su provide support for our customers to go to market. 
So Dimension Data has uh, more than a thousand salespeople that are focused on infrastructure. That's our core business. Um, and what we allow you to do by being part of the Powered by Dimension Data program that gives you the credibility of, of the reliability of the infrastructure, we offer ha have a referral system within our sales team to take you into some of our enterprise corporate base. So we have, um, you know, we have over 3,500 clients here locally in South Africa alone. Uh, it's generally you know, everything from the largest bank to, to, to the mid-market enterprise that you would have. And sometimes that's an important referral system. We'd like to see our cloud platform adopted in the industry. And uh, software vendors that are on our platform, we'd like to encourage the use of their software in those enterprise customers of ours. So it can basically leverage the largest IT company in South Africa, um, you know, that, uh, you know, as you, as you go to market. So just then to summarize, I think that by leveraging the cloud and the cloud providers that are out there, you can optimize your cost, you know, really manage your cash flow and scale when you need to. You can manage by your risk in terms of the availability of the platform and, and, and business continuity, the security, and also minimize the risk in terms of your, uh, your uh, market penetration through extending the, uh, your reach through our sales channel. And then strategic agility to really to be able to be quick to market with new functionality. Uh, we've spoken a lot about that over the last couple of days, but that's really where the benefit of the cloud gives you that ability to be agile, to be innovative, and Brett spoke a lot about, about how you can do that. So thanks very much. I know this was a long stretch and you're off to lunch now. Really appreciate your attention for those that stayed. Thanks very much.